There was once a preacher, and he was tired. This is not my story today. I'm just a little tired. But this preacher had been traveling a lot and visiting with many people. But he was weary because the stresses of life were upon him in such a way that were often overwhelming. But he kept going. He was in Memphis, Tennessee, visiting with people at a church. But he was not scheduled to preach that evening. He wasn't even planning to be there. But when he arrived, the people wanted to hear him. And so he got up and he talked to the people. He had no notes with him, but despite being unprepared, he spoke to them for nearly 45 minutes. Yeah. How? He was a really good preacher. I am not nearly as good, but I can tell you that I use my notes to prevent me from going for 45 minutes. If I don't stick to my prepared script, I can ramble on. But this preacher did not ramble. Instead, he eloquently shared with them a vision. One that was seemingly more from a prophet than a preacher. He had a vision of what was to come and what God was leading them into. They were going through challenging times which required great sacrifice, but the preacher had a vision of God's future, and it was good. He wanted to encourage the people to keep going, to keep moving forward, even if that meant going on without him. This was always a reality with him, but now more than ever. You see, as a preacher, he often said things that made people uncomfortable and challenged the status quo. Because he saw the current state of the world and he knew that it could be better than this. And he challenged people, especially Christians, to a higher standard. And not everyone liked this, especially those who benefited from the status quo. He received numerous death threats throughout his young life. He had nearly died 10 years earlier, but he spoke on that night about how grateful he was that God had allowed him to live and to see what he had seen since. But it all came at great cost and risk. He was warned not to go to Memphis. But he was not afraid. Instead, he was bold and courageous. The words that he spoke that April evening were prophetic. But no one realized at the time just how true they were. He told those people that it may be it may be that soon they would be going on without him and his leadership, but nobody knew that that evening would be his very last. The very next day, the death, th death threats proved real. And that preacher was killed. But his words, his legacy, and his vision continue on to this day. Instead of reading his final sermon, instead of reading his final sermon, I want to play the recording in his own voice. And I won't play the entire 43 minutes, but just the final minute of his conclusion. Bear with me one second as I get the set up. I don't know what's going to happen now. We got 
some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. famously had a dream which he shared 57 years ago this week on the March on Washington and yet it was not just a dream but a vision. He looked at the state of this world with its oppression and injustice, its violence, and he knew that this world could be better than that. And he knew because of his faith in God and in the words of the Bible, the present day paled in comparison to the future that he firmly believed that God was leading them into. It was a promised land to him. Now it's no surprise that the Exodus narrative has long been part of the African-American experience, passed on through song and spirituals like Go Down Moses. The exodus had happened long ago, and slavery had ended a century prior to Dr. King's message, but they were still journeying toward Canaan. They were tired, but Dr. King encouraged them to keep going. For he had been on the mountain top, and God had shown him what was just ahead. And Martin died, believing and knowing that God would get his people there even without him. And so I cannot read the end of Deuteronomy without thinking about Dr. King's I've been on the mountain top speech, not just because of the the direct references to Deuteronomy 34, but because the parallels are too great. We've been journeying through this book throughout the summer and have finally come to the very end of Deuteronomy, which is also the very end of the story of Moses. Today's Christians talk a lot about the early life of Moses, through the ten plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, up to the receiving of the Ten Commandments, but we don't spend a lot of time at the end of his life. Books like Neuter Numbers and Deuteronomy are often considered boring or irrelevant. But I hope that this series has shown that to be far from the truth. As I have noted throughout this summer, this is the story of a people who are in the midst of transition and change, trusting God to lead them safely into something good. And that is us right now. Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses. This book contains his farewell speech which is mostly a reminder of God's law and what God was expecting out of God's people once they finally had a land to call their own. 
They were on the banks of the Jordan River about to cross. But 40 years earlier, 40 long years earlier, their parents and grandparents had been right there. But they chose disobedience. Twelve spies had gone out into Canaan and they saw that it was truly good, just as God said it was. But there were challenges there. And they were fearful of the Canaanites and their walled cities like Jericho. And so they decided that it would be better to go back to Egypt, to go back to slavery, than to cross that Jordan River. Two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, adamantly defended Moses, saying that since God was on their side, they could surely take the land. But the people refused. And so God gave the people exactly what they wanted. Since they chose not to cross, they would not cross. And Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness where that generation would all die. And that included Moses. But that next generation would be given their own chance to choose life. And that is who Moses was addressing in Deuteronomy, including Joshua and Caleb, who would lead the people into the promised land. Once again, they were on the banks of the Jordan River, but this time would be different. Deuteronomy is an encouragement to remain faithful to God, to obey God's good commandments, to choose life, and to keep going. Because the journey was not over yet. The end is the beginning. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah across from Jericho. And there the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, the whole region of the Valley of Jericho, the City of Palms, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. And he buried him in Moab, in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. And since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Who did all the signs and wonders the Lord had sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. The book of Joshua picks up directly after this and tells the story of the conquest of Canaan. 
This wasn't the end for Israel. This was the beginning. They had come so far, but there was still more to come. There were challenges ahead, but what was to come was very good, and Moses got to see it. And I wonder, I wonder if it was how he imagined it. Moses remembered that giant cluster of grapes that the spies had, had brought back proof of just how fertile and prosperous the land was. Moses had spent the last 40 years dreaming about Canaan and what life would be like for God's people there. And though he would not be joining them in that good land, he was at least given a preview of what was to come, and that is all Moses needed. Moses had climbed a lot of mountains, even in his old age. He had spent a lot of time alone with God and was closer to God than anyone else alive. Saying goodbye to his family, to the new leaders Joshua and Caleb, and to all of the people of Israel that he had, that he had seen born and raised in that desert of Sinai, Moses made his way up to the top of Mount Nebo. You can climb that mountain yourself today in the modern country of Jordan. It rises about 2,300 feet above sea level, and on a clear day from that summit, you can even see Jerusalem in the distance. Now, thanks to the internet, you can see the pictures, though I, I imagine it's not the same as seeing it in person. And today, even if you're there, it's not the same view as what Moses saw thousands of years ago, but you could understand why God led him up that mountain. Moses was given a glimpse of home. Centuries before Moses had been born, his ancestor Abraham had been promised that land. Isaac and Jacob knew it well. And it remains in the collective memory of one generation after another in Egypt. Songs were sung. Grandparents would tell their grandchildren the stories of the land flowing with milk and honey and how one day they would return to it because God had promised them that they would and their God was faithful. And at times, those stories may have seemed like legends and myths. But here, Moses was seeing it with his own eyes, which despite his age, had not lost their sight. God had preserved his strength and vision for that very moment. And with that breathtaking view of the promised land, Moses breathed his last. He was buried not by human hands, but he was buried by God. And the entire community mourned the legendary leader that had brought them this far. Some may wonder if Moses died with sorrow having come so close to the promised land, but not being able to enter it himself. But I don't think so. Moses was a prophet, and his vision was bigger than himself. He was able to see what was to come, not for him, but for God's people. And what Moses saw was good. It was so good. Moses could rest well knowing that though his story was over, Israel's story was not. Moses could finish his life on earth knowing that his story wasn't about him, but he was simply one small part of God's story. And God's story was not over yet. In fact, there was more to it than even Moses 
could imagine. When Moses died on that mountain, he did not know that this would not be his final mountaintop experience with God. There would be another. And he would be joined by another prophet who met God on mountains. Elijah. And the two of them would join someone far greater than they. Jesus, the Son of God, transfigured in all of His divine glory, His face shining like the sun. Together they spoke with Jesus about what was to come, not just about what would happen in Jerusalem and on Mount Calvary, but what that would mean for God's people and what God had planned for them. Something good was coming. Even if great sacrifice would come before them. On the Mount of Transfiguration, once again, God gave Moses a glimpse. Not a geographical one this time, but a spiritual one. It was no longer about physical territory or an earthly kingdom, but a heavenly one. God's blessings were about to expand way beyond a small strip of land in the Middle East to envelop the entire world, not just descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but for all who would join the family of Jesus Christ. The story of the earthly ministry of Jesus was about to end, but the story of Christ and His church was just beginning. And that is a story which continues on to this day. God is calling us into something good, something better, something perfect. But we are not there yet. We are never fully arrived, which is why we are always in transition. We must always keep going. I mean, look around at the state of the world. We can be better than this. We've made a lot of progress, but God is not done with us yet. We are tired and we are weary from the challenges and the sacrifices, but we are not alone. Our God is with us, and God is on our side. God gave Moses the strength he needed to keep going to the very end, and God's Spirit empowers us to do the great things that God is calling us to do. Moses had his problems, his failures, his sins, but just as God taught him at the burning bush, it would not be about Moses, but what God would accomplish through him. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't perfect either, but he did a lot of great things in his 39 years of life. It was not about MLK, but what God accomplished through him and so many others, and which God is still doing to this day. That work is not over yet. The dream of ra racial reconciliation and equality continues to be made real. Like Moses... And like MLK, our church is not perfect. But God has blessed our church community greatly in our history together. And yet it is not about any one of us, but what God has and is and will accomplish through us together. But we must keep going. We must cross every river. We must march into the promised land of God's good future and be not afraid. We must be strong and courageous. Where are we going? 
Where is God leading us? What is God calling us to do? Let us never stop asking ourselves these questions. Let us never grow complacent or satisfied to remain where we are. Let us keep going. Because there is a lot of work to be done. But our God is a busy God and He's calling us to be busy with Him. There are Wounds in this world which need healing, injustices to make right, lost sheep to bring home, hungry people to feed, and lonely people to love. And in doing all of this, may we give the world a glimpse. May the church be a preview of what is to come. Let us lead people from the valleys and plains of this world up that mountain so that they can see the panorama of heaven. For our eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Lord, come quickly. Amen.